So my name is Erin Jesse, and I'm going to be talking about, in many ways, some of the research that's kind of inspired this workshop. Um, I'm going to be talking about female genocide there in post-genocide Rwanda. Um, the research that underlies this presentation is not really the main thrust of what I've been doing over the years in Rwanda, um, where I've been working since around 2007. Um, it's sort of become a, a side project, a side obsession of mine over the years, primarily because um, in the research that I was doing in Rwanda, I ended up going into some of the prisons there and spending time talking to Genocidaire about why they had done, uh, why they had participated in the crimes that they did, um, what had motivated them, this kind of thing. It was part of a sort of larger transitional justice pro pro um, project on genocidal intent during the Rwandan genocide. Um, and what was particularly important for me that came out of all the different types of interviews that I did was this idea that any time I tried to ask, in particular, the women that I was interviewing about their experiences during the genocide, they always tried to bring it back to their claims of suffering, their claims of victimization. Um, and over the years, I really struggled with how to make sense of this, simply because in Rwanda, even the concept of genocidaire is defined very much by the state. And it's not something that women can easily escape once it's been applied to them. It's not something that men can easily escape once it's been applied to them. It's something that will haunt them throughout their lives. And the standard by which one is legally determined to be a genocidaire is, again, very much state determined. There is a transitional, pro, pro, um, transitional justice project that has taken shape in Rwanda that involves everything from national trials to gachacha and a range of other sort of more local level initiatives um, that isn't really necessarily as legally rigorous as we might like to see. And so what this means is that you do end up coming across a lot of people who are in prison for the crime of genocide, broadly defined, and who ne aren't necessarily actually guilty of the crimes that they've com been committed. Um, the standards by which they've been convicted of genocide are very flexible. Um, in some cases, it's based on hearsay, on rumor, um, on personal agendas and, and interpersonal conflicts and this kind of thing. And so over the years, what I began to realize was that some of these women, not only might they be innocent, but that their claims to victimization, their claims to suffering and so on, weren't something that I should just kind of idly sweep to the side. They were actually something I should really pay attention to. And so that's how this presentation has kindly kind of come to fruition. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background then, Rwanda is one of the most densely occupied countries in Africa, um, and this dense population um, is part of the sort of root causes of the 1994 genocide. Um, prior to the genocide, it was understood that Rwanda was occupied by three different ethnic communities, one being the Hutu that made up the majority of the population. There was then a minority Tutsi population that made up about four, uh, 14 to 15 percent of the population. And then there was the indigenous Twa population, and these were sort of indigenous hunter-gatherers made up less than one percent of the population. The official languages in Rwanda are Kinyarwanda as well as French and English. Um, and it's predominantly a Christian country, though this is changing over time. We're seeing different groups come in. And one of the really important things to understand about Rwanda, particularly in the present, is that the genocide that happened in 1994 has very much overshadowed much of its history as a result. The brutality of the killings in which an estimated 800,000, 400,000 to 800,000 civilians were murdered, um, the rapid nature of the conflict, most of the killings were very much a local level, sort of implement, um, implemented the local level and involve things like machetes and so on. So it was also very low technology. And all of these things have kind of come together to create this understanding of Rwanda that in a lot of ways is defined by what happened in 1994, defined by the genocide. And so in the genocide then, we have this group of genocidaire that have emerged. And genocidaire is a distinctly Rwandan term. It essentially, it's, it's taken from a French root but it's been adapted to the Kinyarwanda language and it's being used in Rwanda today basically to, um, to encapsulate individuals who have committed a range of crimes related to the genocide. And so what we see then happening um, in relation to the 1994 genocide is we have three categories of crimes. The first is category one, they're organizers, they're inciters of the genocide, so high level leaders, um, the people who gave orders, gave commands, the people who were in charge of the media that was operative in the country around the genocide and these kinds of things. Then there's the category two genocidaire, which include the people who um, basically were the murderers, the torturers, the individuals who are uh, mutilating the dead, this kind of thing. Um, and then we have the category three perpetrators, who um, mostly are, are, are 
individuals who committed crimes against, pro against property, so they were looters and this kind of thing, um, stealing from the individuals who'd fled or who had been murdered. And so within this concept then of the genocidaire, we see approximately 2,000 women in the prisons um, who have been found guilty or who are awaiting trial for having committed crimes related to genocide. Now, these women, it, it's fair to say that all genocidaires are subject to a certain amount of social stigmatization. Um, they have very much reduced rights within the prisons. Um, they're often in a position where if they're awaiting trial, they may wait years for any kind of trial. Um, if they've been tried, they've been perhaps tried at the local level. Um, and as I mentioned before, the evidence that's been used against them perhaps is not really what we would consider legally rigorous evidence. So there's a lot of animosity. There's a lot of frustration among genocidaires as a whole. But in Rwanda, women seem to suffer an additional level of social stigmatization for having participated in these kinds of crimes. And part of the reason for this, um, as I'll go into in, in a moment, is this historical pre precedence, this sort of social standard for what constitutes appropriate behavior for women in Rwanda, whether it's during times of peace or during times of conflict. And so what we see is that women are often, they're not just genocidaire, but in addition, they're considered monsters, they're considered demons. And there is evidence to suggest that they then receive disproportionately harsh prison sentences as a result, as well as a range of other sort of human rights abuses and, um, and vulnerabilities within the prison system once they're imprisoned. So the methodology that underlies this paper, just to give you a bit of an indication, this is not what you would consider to be classical ethnography by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the terms of my research was very much determined by the Rwandan government. And so what this means is that even though I'm an ethnographer, even though I do try to very much immerse myself in everyday events and these kinds of things, I was, um, my field work was constricted by the terms of the fact that these women were in prison, the men that I was interviewing were in prison, it meant that I never actually got to see what their everyday lives were like within the prison structures that I visited. I was always sort of brought into the main courtyard where most of the administrative staff worked. Um, they usually set aside a little room for me where we had some privacy, where we could sit and conduct interviews as long as we needed to. Um, but it meant that anything I learned about these women's everyday lives came from their narratives, came from what they told me. I never got to see it with my own eyes. So in that sense, this is not a traditional ethnography by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but what I tried to do in order to kind of deal with this methodological limitation is really focus on allowing the women and providing them with opportunities to describe their narratives, their life histories, their experiences very much in their own terms. So I didn't ask a lot of questions, particularly in the initial encounters. I would try to get them to just speak openly about their lives by asking them very open-ended questions like, please tell me about your life or what is it like you know, living in the prison and this kind of thing, and then let them sort of take the interviews where they wanted to. Um, in, in later stages with these women, um, I would then sometimes follow up with more thematic interviews where I did come in with a list of prepared questions and, and tried to focus in on specific issues that they'd seem to, um, to find interesting or relevant about their lives. Um, and of course, one of the big limitations as well that I should mention is that um, though I had studied French in the lead up to going to Rwanda, there's a transition taking place in Rwanda. French used to be the second language there. But over the years, with the arrival of the Rwandan Patriotic Front, which is the current government, an Anglophone to boot, um, there's been a transition away from using French in the public settings. Um, individuals who do still speak French tend to be identified with the pre-genocide regime, which can put them in a bit of a messy situation in relation to the current government. And so I found that most people didn't want to speak French with me. So I ended up having to then resort to hiring Kenya Rwandan researchers uh, Rwandan research assistants who were fluent in Kinyarwanda so that we could accommodate people in their indigenous language, um, the language of their choosing. And so this also, as I talk about in the paper, introduced certain um, interesting features. Um, one of the big things being that the political affiliation, the perceived political affiliation of my research assistants was always the, um, the elephant in the room, so to speak, whether or not they were perceived as being um, particularly supporters of the current government really affected the way that people related to them. And I often found that, you know, even though I'd expected my identity as a foreign researcher to be a subject for discussion in these interviews, they were often much, much more interested in my research assistants and who they knew and who they might be talking to and, and so on. So. Just a little bit of background there on the methodology. Um, so it's important, as I mentioned before, to talk about what constitutes appropriate conduct for women in times of peace and in times of war in Rwanda. 
Um, generally speaking, if we go back and look at the sort of colonial and pre-colonial history in Rwanda, what you see is this pattern whereby women are largely excluded from formal involvement in politics, commerce, law, and this kind of thing. Um, so it means that they enjoyed reduced status in society. And it doesn't mean that they didn't have any power, they didn't have any agency, of course. There are different ways of working outside of these mechanisms. Um, but in terms of their appropriate conduct, they were often rewarded or sort of commended for qualities like um, submissiveness, modesty, their ability to raise good children um, who were polite and well-mannered and this kind of thing. Um, and they didn't really get any kind of reward or any kind of social acceptance from trying to make their way in what would be considered the man's world in Rwanda. So things like business and politics and so on. Um, women who tried to resist this, and there have been women throughout Rwandan history that have done so, generally had a major uphill battle ahead of them. The one exception being political elites. There have been women in Rwandan history, people like Kanjigera, who's the woman whose um, image is before you, um, who's even today rather infamous in Rwanda as a poisoner and a manipulator. She was the queen mother um, and, and is known for having committed a range of atrocities and having really manipulated Rwandan politics um, with the start of the colonial period from behind the scenes, um, you know, using every sort of opportunity to, to manipulate power that was available to her. So there is evidence to suggest that certain political elites, women, um, women who are political elites, have been able to work against this. But for your average ordinary Rwandan woman, these avenues are not, were not available to her. And so if she did try to, say, take part in politics or, or speak vocally in a community setting, she could actually be punished for being a man-woman. And, and they have a range of different terms that they use to kind of stigmatize women who attempt to, to find a place for themselves in, in parts of Rwandan society that are considered the traditional domain of men, so to speak. Um, in 1973, um, prior to 1973, there had also always been a very, very strong taboo against women actively participating in violence. Um, so picking up weapons and these kinds of things, women, it was actually taboo for women to touch them um, because it was thought that doing so would um, contaminate the weapons. It would result in the, the man who used those weapons, who owned those weapons, um, losing in battles, um, becoming injured and this kind of thing. So women weren't even really supposed to handle weapons in Rwanda. Um, but in 1973, there was a period of ethnic violence in Rwanda that surrounded the coup of Juvenal Habyarimana, who became president in 1973. Um, and during this period, there was a lot of anti-Tutsi violence in Rwanda, and a number of, of Tutsi families actually ended up fleeing the country. Um, and this is the first time in Rwanda that we actually see these taboos against women participating in warfare being relaxed. And a number of women, um, it's been documented by African rights, actually did pick up weapons. Um, they were not just cheerleaders of the violence, the anti-Tutsi violence that took place, but they were actually assisting in the killing and the torturing and the mutilation of the dead and this kind of thing. And in the aftermath of 1973, with Juvenal Habyarimana coming into power, there was never any kind of legal redress for this. Um, none of these people, none of the perpetrators, period, were brought to justice. And so there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that this then set a dangerous precedence going forward for not just um, anti-Tutsi violence on a general level, but specifically the involvement of women in mass atrocities in Rwanda. And so this brings me then up to the present, where we have the 1994 genocide. And in the paper that I prepared for the workshop today, I tried to focus on the narratives of three women. These are just three of the eight women that I worked with um, in, a, in a fair amount of detail. And they're by no means the only amazing stories that kind of came out of the research that I'd done with female genocidaire. But there are three of the stories that kind of resonated mostly with me, just because these women were so articulate in their ability to really put their, you know, the nail on the, or hit the nail on the head in terms of exactly how their lives were being negatively impacted, specifically because of their identity as women and so on. Um, so in particular, like Devota was a low-level genocidaire. She was in prison um, and had been convicted for having um, committed a range of harms, mostly bodily harms. Um, she was accused and, and found guilty of having killed women, Tutsi women and Tutsi babies, using brochette, which are these little um, wooden skewers that they put meat on to grill. And um, she may or may not have been innocent. I mean, in Rwanda, it's very, very difficult to actually ascertain the extent to which people have committed the crimes of which they've been found guilty. So that's something I can't really comment upon, other than the fact that it makes me incredibly uncomfortable as a researcher to feel so out of control of actually understanding whether or not the person in front of you is guilty and, and deserving, so to speak, of, of, the, of being imprisoned. Um, 
but she had come from a background of subsistence farming. Um, she didn't have a whole lot of education. She wasn't particularly literate. She'd been married at a very, very young age because the family had economic problems. And she'd been brought up in this sort of um, socialized to, to see the family, her ability to sort of raise children and so on as her primary responsibility. So she was not a career woman by any state of, stage of the imagination. Um, she claimed not to have had any particularly strong anti-Tutsi sentiments in, in having become um, involved in the 1994 genocide. And she did admit to things like looting and so on, um, so sort of category three crimes. She claimed that really this was not something that um, she'd ever anticipated doing in her future. And she consistently referred to herself as a weak woman incapable of causing anybody bodily harm and this kind of thing. So she was constantly throughout her interviews going back to this idea that she was a victim, that she was being harmed, and she specifically rooted these claims to victimization in the fact that she was a woman. And so at one point she actually said, you know, I feel like I've lost my status. I'm no longer a Rwandan woman. I'm not Rwandan because I, this government, they don't represent me. They give me no rights. I no longer have my citizenship. And I'm no longer a woman because my, my gender identity effectively has been stripped. They make me wear these uniforms, these pink uniforms that are very nondescript. Most women wear pretty much the same thing. Um, you know, they make the women shave their heads for hygienic reasons, but nonetheless, you know, a woman's ability to style her hair and so on in Rwanda is, is part of how she identifies as a woman. And there were all these different things about her experiences in the prison system that she saw as having kind of stripped her of this, of this identity, not only as a Rwandan, but explicitly as a woman. And she was quite vocal about this. Conversely, I interviewed two women, two out of the eight, who were more from a political elite background. And with these women, what I found interesting was that they didn't resort to claims about gender-based discrimination when they talked about how they were victims. They still really claimed victim status for themselves um, and didn't admit to having really committed much in the way of crimes. Again, it's okay for women to admit to looting. There's no stigma associated with that necessarily. But as soon as you admit to murder, as soon as you admit to torture, etc., it's a whole other ballgame. Um, so women never admit to this. Um, there was only one woman I ever interviewed who kind of admitted to murder. Um, but they were very much politically active in their lives prior to the genocide. They were career driven. Um, they both kind of had positions within the government. One as a journalist, a very prominent RTLM journalist, and the other as a, um, a cell level government official. They also denied anti-Tutsi sentiments, but when they talked about the events leading to their um, arrest and imprisonment and the stigmatization that they were experiencing, they tend to frame it more in political terms. They were victims of victor's justice. They were victims of, um, they were basically political pawns that were sacrificed by their superiors within the genocidal government, the MRND and the interim government, um, and left to kind of take the blame for the atrocities that had occurred. And so whereas the low level genocidaire and the women who didn't sort of come from this political elite background saw themselves victimized primarily as women, um, the political elites, the two political elites that I interviewed, really did have much more of a broad political understanding of what had happened to them. And so none of them would take responsibility for the crimes that they committed. They were much more interested in their dealings with me in talking about how they had been victims as well. And this leads to, leads to some interesting problems for a researcher. Because, of course, it's fine to acknowledge in a context like this that women in Rwanda can be victims of um, gender-based discrimination, that they might be disproportionately subject to um, harsh prison sentences in comparison to their male counterparts. But you can't really talk about these things in Rwanda. You would not, in the context of, say, a Rwandan conference, want to say anything about these women as victims, right? Because they are monsters. They are demons. They've done horrible, horrible things. They're unforgivable. There is no room to really talk about the status as victims. And it's an important, I think, ethical conundrum that researchers need to think through. Because, of course, when we give these women a platform to really talk about the ways in which they're suffering, on one hand, this is perfectly fine. Because most people, when they're perpetrators, have also been victimized on some level. right? Um, but there, there are situations where it becomes totally politically inappropriate and even impossible to talk about these things. And Rwanda is one of those contexts. And so. This paper is basically um, an attempt to kind of begin thinking through some of these issues. Um, you know, in allowing these women or providing them a space to really assert claims of victimization over the crimes that they would have committed or potentially committed, over the harms that they were involved in and so on. I mean, is it really ethical as a researcher to do so? Um, and, and if so, you know, how do we proceed in an ethical manner? So I think at this point I'm running out of time, so I'll stop there, but I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation further. Okay, thanks very much.